Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we are live for an hour each weekday afternoon. We have an open phone line that you can call in. If you have questions you'd like to discuss about the Bible or the Christian faith, if you have a different viewpoint from the host, either as a Christian seeing some things differently or maybe you're not a Christian want to talk about that, I'd actually uh, certainly love to encourage non-Christian people to call in because I'm always curious to know how they think. Uh, To me, as a person who really cares that what I believe should and must be the truth, that is to say I don't want to settle for something that isn't the truth, and I'm very motivated to study out before I choose to believe something. Uh, And I know, of course, that all the evidence that can be studied is in favor of Christianity, of Jesus Christ being authentic. There's just no evidence at all of another sort out there. I always wonder why anybody would, uh, would frankly, not be a Christian if they have the ability to study this out. It either, it either means they haven't studied it very well, it seems to me, or maybe they don't care enough about it, and I can't understand that either. If Jesus was who he said he is, that'd certainly be something to care about. So, I mean, I'm always interested if someone out there is not a believer, not a Christian, uh, and I'm not, I, you know, I'm not no put down here or anything. I'm just curious to know why. And I'd love to hear from you if you want to give me some feedback about that. Why don't you believe in Christ? Um, But most of our callers do believe in in one way or another in Jesus and have questions about the Bible. You can call about any of that stuff. You can call to disagree. The number is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. 5737. And we'll talk first to Brian calling from Austin, Texas. Brian, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hello, Brother Steve. Uh, always good to talk to you and hear your voice. Thank the, you. Uh, I'm calling uh, about something that came up probably in the last month or two. I go to a home church and I attend a, an institutional church to take my kids there uh, so other people can talk to them about the Lord. But the uh-huh. pastor there, uh, he was going through Ephesians, and he focused on Ephesians 4.30, um, which is, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Yeah. And basically he said, um, since God has sealed the believer with the Holy Spirit, then he believed then that person really who had been sealed by the Holy Spirit could not lose their salvation. And uh, I know that you believe that the only way a person can lose their salvation is if they quit believing in the Lord. And so I wanted to say, what, how, what would be your rebuttal to what he said right there? And I'll uh, take your answer off the air. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Brian, for calling. Actually, this passage is often brought up by those who believe you cannot lose your salvation. And I've never understood why they think this uh, from this passage. I'm, I'm wondering what they think it means to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Clearly, they have a thought about it that is different than what Paul stated, uh, or and it's certainly different than what I would see it to mean. Um, I mean, he says, if someone is saying, well, God sealed us with the Holy Spirit, and therefore we can't lose our salvation, I think, okay, so how are they picturing this sealing as something that makes it impossible to lose your salvation? And I think what they usually do is they don't understand what the word seal means in the Bible. They're thinking in modern terms, like, you know, uh, I heard someone give the example of, you know, when I, you know, change my, uh, you know, something in my engine. I don't remember what kind of job he's doing because I don't know mechanics. You know, I'll put a grease seal on there and the seal will prevent any dirt from getting in there and from any oil getting out or whatever. And he says that means that, you know, if God has sealed me, then I can't get out and he can't and nothing can get in and so forth to get at me. I'm sealed. So they kind of see it like you're in a sealed room or a sealed compartment, like hermetically sealed or something like that. These are modern concepts of sealing. Uh, although they did seal, I'm sure, in the sense that they might not call it that, but they might seal uh, a jar or something like that. But that's not what seal means in the old. I mean, when, when the Bible says that Jesus' tomb was sealed so that no one would open it, we might think that meant that they came and they soldered, you know, a a bead around it or something like that so that no one could move it. No, they put a seal on it. A seal was an official signet. It means that they put, uh, you know, the the king's or in this case, Pilate's seal on the tomb saying this is officially closed. No one is allowed to open it. It wasn't that it was impossible to open it. It just no one was authorized. It, it It had a seal on it. The seal suggests that an authority 
has, you know, decreed something here. Now, if you sealed a, a, a letter, for example, you'd put a dollop of uh, molten wax on the letter and you'd, the man who wrote the letter would, or who was sending the letter would stick his ring in it because if he was an official, he would, uh, he'd have a signet ring that would only he had. And so by sticking it in the wax, he'd leave his seal. It'd be a sealed document. It doesn't mean it's sealed and nobody can open it. It means it's got the seal of authenticity on it. It's got the, the evidence that it came from him. It's, it's a guarantee that it is his. And to say that God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, all, what that means is he has guaranteed that we are his. Certainly all Christians believe that, whether they believe you can lose your salvation or not. We do believe that when we're in Christ, we're his. And he has given that evidence of our genuinely being his by giving us his Holy Spirit. Just like a document might have a wax seal. We know then it's genuinely from the person whose signet is in there. The Holy Spirit is the wax seal, as it were, upon us. Not literally so, of course, but the idea is what Paul's saying is the way we know we're genuine, the way we know we really belong to God is because he's put his seal upon us and his seal would be his mark upon us. In fact, um, you know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about people having God's seal on their forehead. Uh, the the 144,000, he puts his seal on their forehead. Now, he's not, he's not sealing something shut. He's just putting a mark on the forehead that is his seal, the evidence that they belong to him, as opposed to those who have the mark uh, and this, of the beast upon them. They belong to the beast. So, I mean, this is, it's just an indicator of genuineness. When Paul says we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, what he, he's not saying, you know, now we're trapped. Uh, he's not saying anything about that. If we are, then Paul will have to discuss that in other terms because that's not what this means. It doesn't mean anything about not being able to get unsaved. It just means that we have, by having the Holy Spirit, he is the evidence, the seal of genuineness. He is the evidence that we really are Christians. And, uh, you know, you don't have to believe some doctrine of once saved, always saved to believe that when we're following Jesus and we're in Christ, we're really Christians. We really are. And we really have the Holy Spirit. And that's all that Paul says. He, in his statement, he's not speculating one way or the other about whether we will always be Christians. When we have the Holy Spirit, when we are followers of Christ, when we're believers, uh, this, is, this is the proof of our genuineness. That's what he's saying. It, it, there's no suggestion of the proof of permanence necessarily. Now, someone might say, well, would God put a temporary seal on? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, we don't, it depends on the nature of the seal, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's not talking about permanence or temporariness. He's just talking about genuineness. Having the Holy Spirit is the genuine, the proof that we are genuine Christians. That's what he's saying. So, uh, but, but people who try to prove that you cannot lose your salvation often give this as an example, which means I think, well, what are you thinking a seal means? You must think that we're like sealed into a jar, like, uh, like, preserves in a mason jar and there's an airtight seal on it and you know no dirt can you know no germs can get in and and the the you know preserves can't get out well if if he was talking about mason jars i suppose then that would maybe make the point but he's not talking about that he's talking about seals in the ancient world not modern world okay so this is i think just a way that christians who perhaps haven't thought through the thing very well misunderstand that particular point all right let's talk to david from portland oregon david welcome to the narrow path thanks for calling oh thank you um in uh the first verse of chapter one of revelation uh, talks about uh these things are going to happen soon yeah but then in over in i think it's revelation 310 when he's talking to the church of philadelphia he says i'm coming soon so uh you know in some cases you know uh we're talking about stuff that's going to be happening in the lifetime or shortly after the lifetime of john in other cases jesus has said he's coming soon but it's been two thousand years and it's been no jesus coming back yet so um i'm thinking that maybe some of the stuff that they're talking about in revelation could be still, there's a, you know, it could happen now. 
Well, that is the way most popular teaching about Revelation goes and makes that same assumption. But I think the, the, the probably the flaw in the reasoning here is that you say, well, it says that Jesus is coming soon, and since he didn't come, then maybe he didn't really mean soon. Um, but maybe something did happen that he's referring to as his coming. It wouldn't be his second coming that we're looking for. See, I'm, I'm looking for him to come and raise the dead and make a new heaven and a new earth and all those things that he promised to do, and he's going to do that someday. But that's not the only event that the Bible refers to as the coming of, law, of the Lord or the coming of God. Uh, for example, uh, in Revelation 3, uh, 20, Jesus said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him. He's not talking about the second coming. He does talk about himself coming, but not coming in the sense of the, on the last day when he comes and raises the dead. He's going to come into them. Jesus said uh, similar things in, in uh, John chapter 14. He said, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me and my father will love him and we will come and make our home with him. So there's a sense in which he comes like that. But there's other senses in which he comes because uh, in the Old Testament, and Jesus, of course, spoke in the language of the Old Testament, uh, it was commonplace to speak of God coming when it's not talking about what we're thinking of it by the second coming. For example, uh, when, when the uh, Israelites had come back from the Jews, the Jews had come back from Babylon and God spoke to them through the prophet Zechariah, he says, I have returned to Jerusalem. And, well, what he means is his favor has come back to Jerusalem. They've been under punishment in Babylon. Now he's, his favor, his grace is remembered. He says, I have returned. Uh, well, if we heard Jesus say, I have returned, we'd think he was talking about the second coming. But obviously, that's not how, what it means there. In the Old Testament, very commonly, when God is judging a nation, it might be Babylon, it might be Egypt, it might be some other nation, it might even be Israel, he often says that he comes and uh, he's coming to judge. Now, what that really refers to in those cases is that he's sending armies of aliens to come and conquer them, and that's going to be his judgment upon them. It's like he himself is personally doing it, but he's doing it through his own agents, which in this case would be invading armies. Now, there are many people who recognize that Jesus spoke about his coming in more than one way. As I mentioned, he mentioned that he will come into somebody if they open the door. That's not talking about the second coming. Uh, in another instance... In the letter to the Ephesians, in Revelation chapter 2, the letter to Ephesus, he says, if you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I was not talking about the second coming there because the church of Ephesus doesn't exist anymore. So when Jesus comes back, he's not going to remove their lampstand. It's been long gone for centuries now. And in fact, there's not even a city of Ephesus anymore. So he must have fulfilled his threat. He came to them and removed their lampstand. But it wasn't the second coming. And so Jesus even said in Matthew 16, 28, he says, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, there was a coming of Jesus in his kingdom of sorts in the lifetime of some of those people. Certainly, if Revelation was talking about that event, then he could say, I'm coming soon. And that is what he said, I'm coming soon. Now, the point here is that we have to take each each time we read about God coming or Jesus coming or God returning or things like that, which are in many cases figures of speech, we have to decide what is the context here? What is this event that he's talking about as his coming? It might be, and it is in some cases, his second coming at the end of the age when he literally does come down. Like the angel said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, they said, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus whom you saw going to heaven shall come back in the same way as you saw him go. So that hasn't happened yet. That's going to come back. He's going to come back in the same way that he left, uh, they said. And Paul talks about that too. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and so forth. And so we can see that there is a coming where the Lord himself comes. But there's also times the Bible uses the typical biblical phrase, which is figurative. It's not talking about him literally coming in some instances, but there are times when God figuratively can be said to be coming. Now, this wouldn't be his, there's not second, third, and fourth comings of Jesus. These, the word coming in this case is a figure of speech. When Jesus comes back at the end of the age, that's not a figure of speech. He 
But there are comings of the Son of Man. For example, Jesus, when he sent out the 12, two by two, in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 28, he says, if they don't receive you in one village, go to another. Don't, don't delay because you will not have covered all the villages of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, it seems hardly likely that he's talking about his second coming, which was at that point two, at least 2,000 years distant. Uh, they certainly could have plenty of time to reach the villages of Israel in that time. But there must be something closer in that was going, going to be an issue for them and that they had to hurry because the Son of Man was going to come. And again, that might be the same instance or the same incident that he's talking about when he says, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming. Now, there are many who believe, and I'm one of them, that there are times in the New Testament where the coming of Jesus is referring not to his second coming, but to the judgment that came on Jerusalem from Jesus in AD 70, and who believe that Revelation is talking about that. So that it says these things must shortly take place. The time is at hand. I'm coming quickly. Uh, these would all be references to the fact that there's a judgment coming on Jerusalem quickly. It's from God. It's a judgment from the Lord. And just like many judgments, like the judgment on Babylon in the Old Testament speaks of God coming. Uh, the judgment on Egypt in the Old Testament speaks of God coming. So the judgment on Jerusalem is him coming, as it were. But not really, not literally. Just like Babylon wasn't destroyed by God, God literally coming down from heaven and appearing, it was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. But they were coming at, at God's behest. So it was figuratively speaking of him coming in judgment. So this is how the Bible uses language. The Old and the New Testament both use it that way. And because there are a, a variety of ways that even Jesus speaks about his coming, whether he's coming to remove the lampstand from the church of Ephesus or coming into the person who opens the door uh, or coming in whatever sense he was talking about when he said he'd come in the lifetime of some of his disciples, which I think was referring to A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, we, we, we have to admit there's quite a few different ways the Bible talks about him coming. And so I think in a case where he says, I'm coming soon, he must be talking about something, probably the same thing he was talking about when he said, some of you will not die. Some of you standing here won't die until you see the Son of Man coming. Uh, but it won't be what we're looking for. It's not the end of the age, second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. So that would be my understanding. When the revelation says soon, when it says coming, you know, uh, is at hand, I, I believe it's telling the truth. I think it was talking about something that was at hand, but it used language that we might mistakenly think is a reference to something else, especially if we're not familiar with the uh, biblical way of talking about such things. All right. Uh, Let's talk to Arthur from Utah. Welcome to The Narrow Path, Arthur. Thanks for calling. Hello, Steve. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Today is my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday. Could you speak up a little bit? I, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing yeah, you. Yeah, I can hardly hear you either. How's that? Is okay. That a little bit better? Well, speak up loudly, and we'll, we'll, let's hope the listeners can hear. Go ahead. Okay. How's that? Uh, it's better. Go ahead and now? ask your question. Go ahead and ask your question. I'm, I'm eager to hear it. Okay, Steve, um, I've talked with you before. I am a Christian. My faith is, is uh, lately, I have to say, somewhat diminishing. And it's because of life circumstances, which we all suffer. Um, but my question is, how, Steve, how do I find faith again? How? And it can't be as simple as the word. It's, I don't know what to do anymore. I feel at my now, end. Okay, so you, you've, you've lost your faith and you want to find your faith again. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay, and give me the reasons, if you would, why you lost your faith. If you had faith in God, why uh, would you have stopped lo believing? Lo loss, loss of love, loss of life securities money stuff and and yeah. health like all at once and it hurts bad and i'm and my faith yeah. is diminishing and i i need to know where to go yeah well i certainly i certainly am sympathetic towards you for all all your suffering i and my i'm sure that many of our listeners will be sympathetic and will pray for you but i i don't see how those things would would add up to a loss of faith I, i've been through those things too 
and I didn't see any reason for that to make me stop believing in God. So, I mean, what what is the you connection have, between have, those you things? Have? Pardon? Well, I've I've you lost have, I've lost I'm sorry. I've lost three wives. I've lost three wives. One one died and I two divorced that. me. That's both. Those are painful. And I've lost I've I'm lost sorry, all my. Steve, I'm not having. I'm sorry, Steve. I didn't know. No, no, I'm not. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm saying that I understand what it's like to go through that, and I'm not seeing what the connection is between that and losing your faith. You see, Job went through all that very much. Uh, he lost ten children in one day. He lost all his property and lost his health. All the same things you mentioned, and he said. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he said, even if God slays me, I'll still trust him. So obviously those events do not translate automatically into losing your faith. It's what they translate right. into is a test. They're a test of your faith. You see, the presence of those things in the world or in your life don't don't give any evidence one way or the other about whether God exists. I mean, your, your faith is hopefully in God, in his existence and in his goodness. Now, I realize when God allows things to happen to us that we think are very bad, that we might question whether he loves us. And that and that is when we have to ask ourselves, well, does, does God say he loves us? Uh, did he die for me? Did he send his son to die for me? The Bible says the greater love has no man than that. Uh, and God sent his son. He so loved the world, he sent his son. Uh, so the point I would see is that God's love for me is not uh, up for question. Uh, what he did in coming as Christ and dying for me has removed all doubt for all time as to whether he loves me. Now, the question might be, why, since God loves me, has he allowed certain things to happen to me? And certainly Christians have right. occasion to ask That's that. That's the question. That is the question, Steve. Yeah. That's the well, question. I don't understand what I'm to do. And I don't either. I don't either. I don't know why God is doing that. The question is this. When you're going through those things, why would you turn from your faith at that time when what you need most at that time is to be close to God? I don't know. I because I'm scared. Um, and okay. I should not. You're right. I understand what you're saying. But <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, man. I'm I realize sorry. you're going through a great trauma. And I'm very, I truly am sorry. I, but I'm trying to say something that might be helpful, too. And that is that Thank when you. bad things happen, turning to God is the is the rational thing to do, the sensible thing to do, because that's who we need. I mean, we need God at all times, and especially in those times, we need we need His grace, we need His assistance, we need His comfort. And Paul said, and by the way, Paul went through worse things than you or I have ever dreamed of going through. Sure, and, I know, and, I know. And imprisoned and eventually beheaded. But he said uh, he, he talked about these things as our light afflictions which are but for a moment. He says they work for us a far more eternal weight of glory. But he said it's as oh, we do not look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. I think one of the problems we have when these things happen, these are things that are seen. What is not seen at times like that is the goodness of God. We can't see the goodness of God when he's not doing what we would like him to do. And therefore, but faith is the evidence of things not seen. So we have to say, okay, is God good? Yes, he is. How do I know that? Well, if he wasn't, he wouldn't be so gracious to us. And even even in our trials, we, we're receiving much better things than we deserve in many respects. But also he sent his son. Again, the sending of Jesus is uh, is the way that we know that God is good and that he loves us and that he's like Jesus. And Jesus encountered people who were deathly sick, people who were, you know, lost, loved and, and things like that. Uh, and he, you know, he drew near to them. The Bible says that God is near to those who have a broken heart and of a contrite spirit. So, I mean, these are the things that, these are the things that we need, to, we need to draw near to God, not further from him. Now you say, how can I get my faith back? You choose your faith. You, I mean, there have been times when my faith has been under such attack that I didn't feel, I didn't feel, you know, necessarily the nearness of God at all, but I, I made a firm choice. I, my, my choice was, I, I would even say it out loud. I said, I will believe God. I, mean, I was alone when I say it, but it, I, choose to, I choose to believe God. God is righteous. Let God be true and every man a liar. God cannot lie. These are things the Bible affirms. And therefore, uh, I, you know, I choose to believe him. Now, that doesn't mean I feel like I believe him. That's a totally different subject. Uh, you know, uh, I choose to be faithful to him. I choose to trust that he's faithful. 
Now, I don't understand some of the things he does, but I don't have to. Children don't have to understand everything their parents do, but they have to trust them, or they should. At least if they have trustworthy parents, they should. And a, a trustworthy parent might not always be doing things that make the kid feel good. They might sometimes even be disciplining the child or, uh, you know, allowing the child to uh, to act a little more on, on his own, take some responsibility or something. And so they're not holding him up. Like when you take the training wheels off the bicycle for the kid, the kid wants those on and they want you to they want you to hold the handlebars in the seat. But when you let go, it's not because you're not loving them. It's because you're letting them grow. You're teaching them to grow and become more responsible. And God does those kinds of things. The thing here is that we need to turn to God at those times rather than away from him. Um, I have some lectures online if you can access a computer or the app called Making Sense Out of Suffering. And I talk about all these things. There's, I think it's four lectures. It might be more. It's called Making Sense Out of Suffering, and they're free. You just listen to them from the website, which is thenarrowpath.com. I would suggest you hear those, and they may be helpful to you. They would certainly be helpful to me if I didn't know this already, because those are the things that have helped me when I was going through sufferings. And it's all biblical. It's called Making Sense Out of Suffering. It's at thenarrowpath.com. And under the tab that says Topical Lectures, I hope that might be helpful to you. I need to take a break, but I'll be right back. Please stay tuned for 30 seconds. Small is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. Welcome to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you but everything to give you. When today's radio show is over, we invite you to study, learn, and enjoy by visiting thenarrowpath.com where you'll find free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Remember, thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian life, we can talk about them. And uh, if you have differences of opinion with the host, you can talk about that. Our line right now, all of our lines are uh, full, so you won't be able to get through if you call at this moment. But let me give you the number, because if you keep it on hand, the lines do open up. In probably in the next few minutes, one will open up. So you might want to call in soon if you have this number ready. The number is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. All right, let's talk to Norma from Connecticut. Hi, Norma. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. So uh, my question is related to baptize. Um, when I was little, my parents were um, Catholic, and then as I grew up, they changed religions many, many times, and then um, uh, they never baptized me. But when I was in my uh, 15 years, you know, um, they want they, my mom especially wanted to do the um, what is it called the sweet 16 or 15 and then um, they did that and I <laughs> had no idea you know at that time of being Catholic that they needed that in order to um, to do the ceremony so uh, the priest to make it sure the priest make um, the ceremony and he baptized me at the same place and then I went back and did all that but then now um, I'm older and I have always that question if that really counts as a baptize because I know I'm been reading a lot about you know the Bible and I know you have to be baptized to be saved but I know if that counts and again my parents are not Catholic and thanks to that I'm not Catholic either so um, I'm, I'm still actually searching for the right religion but um, in the meantime I'm, I'm just reading the Bible a lot and I, I definitely okay, well, want to do the right thing okay well so you're saying that you were baptized as a Catholic when you were 16, is that correct? Yeah, well, 15. And, oh, 15. And, and, but you weren't really a believer. You didn't really uh, 
you didn't embrace the, the the Christian faith. You didn't embrace Christ at that time, really, with your heart. You just went through the motions uh, that you to please your parents. Well, to be honest, if we <laughs> I don't know if everybody's like that, but back then, if I remember, we were just going to church, and then uh, a little kid, you know, I was participating okay. in something. Okay. So I, what I hear I you saying, exactly. what I hear you saying, is that you. You weren't really uh, didn't have a relationship with God at the time. You had a, you had some religious involvement, and you, you know your parents were strongly influencing you toward religious involvement in the Catholic Church, and and they wanted you to get baptized, and so you did. Uh, all of this suggests to me that uh, you you may not uh, have been uh, a Christian at the time. It sounds like perhaps you were not. Now, the question would be, have you become a Christian since then? Do you believe that Jesus is your Lord? Yeah, and, and um, now, especially more that I have kids, you know, I want to yeah. pass that information to them. And, and what okay. I have been doing is reading the Bible a lot and, and reading with them. Everybody has their own Bible, and we go from there. But, yeah, um, I, okay, I, if, so, yeah. okay, so... Uh, you're a believer of, in Christ, and you want to pass that down to your children, too. Well, that's that's a good thing. But it seems to me that being baptized, again, would be a good idea. Uh, it might even be something mandatory. Uh, there's controversy about that because some people think that you can be baptized even as a baby. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that, and, and many Protestants don't believe that, uh, that being baptized as a baby is any good because the Bible teaches that the requirements that God has for us to become Christians are to believe and be baptized or repent and be baptized. Both statements are found in Scripture. Um, you know, there in the Bible, Peter says to repent and be baptized in in Acts 2.38. And uh, in, in Mark 16, Jesus says whoever believes and is baptized. Now, to repent and be baptized means you repent first and you baptize second. To believe and be baptized means you believe first and you're baptized second. So the question is, have you repented and believed? These things come before baptism. Now, it sounds like you have. I mean, I don't, I can't tell what's in your heart, but it sounds like you're saying you as an adult have made a commitment to Christ. You want to follow Christ. Um, and that is something that wasn't necessarily the case when you were 15 and got baptized. So if a person who's not a follower of Christ gets baptized, then they didn't become a Christian, and uh, they weren't baptized as a Christian. So assuming that you are a true uh, follower of Jesus now, then it would be a very good thing, I think, to get baptized as a Christian. When I say a very good thing, it's actually, it is mandated to be baptized. Every Christian is commanded to be baptized. Uh, whether you were a real Christian at age 15 or not is what is, uh, is hard, to understand, hard to know. But I'm, I'm thinking... And I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking from what you shared that maybe you, maybe you weren't really a Christian then, in which case you should, in fact, be baptized again. Now, uh, that would be, I don't know where you go to church now. You say you're not a Catholic now, but almost any church that you attend would be glad to baptize you. And I suppose, uh, since you're asking whether you should, I, I believe the answer is yes, you should. I appreciate your call. Okay, let's talk to uh, Larry from Las Vegas. Next, Larry, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve, how are you doing today? Good, thanks. we got a rainy day here in Las Vegas, something unusual. Here, too. My backyard is flooding. We had to go out and buy two sump pumps to, to unflood our yard today. That's how I wow. began my day. Yeah. Well, fortunately, I just fertilized my lawn a few days ago, so I'm really huh. glad to see the rain. All right. Uh, I'm, I was taking advantage of the of the rain and start on my taxes. And I came across a change that they just did. I don't know if you're aware of it, but on your standard deductions, they, uh, they upped it quite a bit. And all you have to do is accept the standard deductions. Well, when you calculate how much you actually gave, looking to see if you're close to that 10% that we're, that we strive to give to our charities, uh, it's about $2,000 or more above that limit. And all you have to do is check a little box that says, take the standard deduction. Well, my thought on that is, 
that's not true. You didn't give that money, and now you're taking a deduction off your taxes, so you're not being honest when you do that. Okay, I, I don't understand tax law very well. I certainly don't understand these standard deductions and stuff. I, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I can't give you any insight about that. You have to talk to a Christian who knows taxes and can explain what that's all about. See, I, I don't okay, do my own, I don't do my own taxes. Get... I just I just give a tax man all, <laughs> all the information and he he files it and I don't think about it. I, I don't even. You ought, to, you ought to try one of these tax uh, programs. They're super and they yeah. really take you. Well, I don't even want to anyway, think about it. Yeah. Let me let me give you another example uh, where I'm coming from. When I'm I was just in question, the Air do, Force, you have, uh, do you have a question for me? Because I got my lines full. Lots question, of people waiting. The question is on is on integrity. Okay. And it's going to make a big difference to the charity organizations because now all you have to do is take a standard deduction. And you haven't given a dime, but you don't have to justify. But uh, but the standard deduction, there, with the standard deduction, that's not really about giving to charity, is it? Yes, it is. Those are your deductions oh, that you have, the legal deductions that you have, your charitable deductions and your taxes that you pay. If you don't but there's other them. deductions. There are other deductions that aren't related to charity. For example, uh, if you have if if you have a yeah if you have a certain number of dependents, right? I mean, th- those are deductions too. So I mean, to Correct. say that they give you a standard deduction doesn't, at least as I understand it, and I I mentioned I don't understand very much about this, but as I understand it, a standard deduction is not related to your charity giving. I think it's just a standard deduction that everyone gets. Uh, in addition to whatever deductions you get for giving to charity, but if I'm if I'm wrong, you need to talk to a tax man about that. I'm afraid I'm not able to give any information about that, not because I won't, but because I can't. I don't know anything. Uh, I'm really really ignorant about tax law. Okay, let's talk to Kyle from Omaha, Nebraska. Kyle, mm-hmm. welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, uh, I had two things. Uh, first is one to say thank you for. Uh, uh, the recommendation to read The Pursuit of God. I really enjoyed that book. Um, yeah, that's a good one, yeah. And then uh, my question is um, about temptation and uh, Satan and the flesh. I was wondering okay. um, what kind of, or what kind of, uh, I guess, percentage would, do we get tempted by Satan? What's, what kind of, how often are we tempted by the flesh? Because I have friends who will say, well, Satan's tempted me, Satan's tempted me, and I think to myself, well, you know, Satan's not omnipresent, and I know he has demons out there too doing his work. But yeah. I, I've always tended to believe that temptation mostly comes from inside us, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Right. Well, uh, I, 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 there's no biblical answer to what percentage of the time we're tempted by the devil and what percentage by the flesh. James said, "Every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed." So, I mean, our own desires. Our own flesh is a factor in temptation, apparently, all the time. Uh, but then Satan could still be involved. I mean, Satan is called the tempter. Now, whether he's involved in every temptation or only in some special cases, I really don't know. But I've, I guess, in, in the absence of information to the contrary, I guess I assume that the devil is involved in just about every temptation, as is my flesh. I I could be wrong about that, but we do battle against Satan and the flesh and the devil. All of these uh, fight against our spiritual lives. And I believe that the way to see them all together would be that Satan is the one who's tempting. What he is making his appeal to is our flesh. And he's using as bait the world. I mean, he's, he's like a fisherman trying to catch you. He's the fisherman the world is the bait, and you're the, your flesh is the fish that's being drawn to the bait. And, uh, I mean, that's kind of a home, homely example, but that's how I always pictured it. So to sure. say, well, how many of our temptations is Satan directly involved in, I don't really know. I've, I guess I'm, I guess I always kind of proceed on the assumption he's involved in all of them. But I'm, that may not be always true. The main thing is we don't have to know if it's the devil or the flesh. We know what the right thing to do is, and we know... Uh, what the wrong thing to do is, because we, we're Christians, we know what Jesus said, and therefore, if we're tempted, it, whether it's the devil or the flesh or or both, uh, it doesn't change what our duty is. Our duty is still to resist the temptation and to obey God. Okay, I appreciate your answer. 
Sure. And, and, you know, some people may feel like, well, it makes a difference because I need to know if I need to resist Satan himself. You know, do I have to, like, say I rebuke you, Satan, or something like that? Some people feel like they have to do some kind of, you know, uh, what should I say, almost face-to-face confrontation with the devil if he's involved. I don't think that's true. I mean, it certainly was the devil that was attacking Job. We can see that very clearly in the first two chapters. But he, uh, Satan didn't, uh, that is, Job didn't address Satan. Uh, he just he just trusted God. Uh, Satan was involved in his testing, but but Job didn't have to deal directly with Satan. He had to just in this case just not succumb to the test to the temptation. And I see it, uh, you know, in Daniel's prayers in their session in Daniel chapter ten when there was a spiritual battle going on in the heavenlies with the prince of Persia and the and the angel that was sent with the answer to Daniel's prayer. The the you know Daniel was I think involved in getting that prayer answered by his continuing praying and fasting. But there was a spiritual warfare he didn't even know about. And he didn't directly confront the devil, but he defeated him. That is to say, resources were sent because of Daniel's prayers to overcome the resistance of the demonic powers. So I think if someone thinks, well, I better know if the devil's involved in this particular temptation, uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, there's some kind of uh, strength to it that I won't be able to overcome it. I... I, that may be thinking wrongly. I think the devil in the world, his whole activity that he's always going about is to test the saints with temptation. Whether he's always personally involved in every temptation or sometimes we just get drawn away by our own desires and the devil wasn't even around, I don't know. I've, but again, I have certain assumptions, but they can't be nailed down scripturally. So you have to just, because the Bible doesn't answer the question you're asking. It doesn't say how sure. often it is our temptations come from the devil. But I, I feel like there's no harm done in just assuming the involvement of the devil uh, as the tempter whenever I'm tempted. But I don't have to confront him specifically. I need to, my prayer has to be to God. A lot of people, you know, when they get involved in spiritual warfare, they start talking to the devil more than they talk to God. And I don't think that's effective. Sure. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, I think that's uh, what I was looking for. All right, Kyle. God bless you. Thank you for your call. All right. Uh, BJ from Round Rock, Texas. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, I was going to call last week because we were doing Matthew chapter 12, and then uh, we ended up not getting to Matthew chapter 12, so that's okay. Um, uh-huh. So now I'll call this week. Uh, 12, Matthew chapter 12, around verse 8, 18, I think. I just looked at it on my phone. Um, he talked. There's a, uh, yeah, 18, there's a prophecy, you know, behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved one, well please put my spirit on him, proclaim justice right. to the Gentiles. Right. Um, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Um, I was wondering why it, why it talks about nations or Gentiles when Jesus kept saying, you know, I only go to the lost house of the Israel, I only go to Israel. And he's always talking to the scribes and Pharisees, but, but sure. then that prophecy says he's he's talking to the nations and the Gentiles. Well, it it does say he will establish justice among the Gentiles, and that's a, a quotation, of course, from Isaiah, uh, yeah. who made that statement of the Messiah. Uh, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4 is being quoted there. And yeah. the, you're right, the, the passage does predict that the Messiah will go to the Gentiles, but that's not the part of, that's not the feature of the prophecy that Matthew is quoting here. The part of the prophecy that he wants to... Uh, wants to see connected with what he's narrating here is that it says he will not uh, quarrel or cry out. And no one will hear yeah. his voice in the streets. A, a bruised reed he will not break. A spoken flax he will not quench. The idea here is that he's describing Jesus as, you know, having a certain manner in, in preaching. Uh, he's being gentle. Uh, it says he warned them not to make him known. He warned the demons not to make him known. Because he didn't want to promote himself. He wanted his promotion to come from God. And, you know, most of us, you know, if you if you pray for your wife when she's got a headache and she gets better, you want to start a magazine, you know, and you're a healing agent <laughs> now, you know. Uh, you know, people want everyone to know all the great things they're doing. And Jesus more or less was trying to tell people, don't talk about this, okay? I'm, I, I'm doing it because it needs to be done, but don't, you know, let's not make a big deal about this. And it's not that Jesus wanted to be totally obscure, although he seemed to strive for that for the most part, but he knew that his father would 
would promote him. I think everybody, every Christian, certainly people in ministry should have this approach that, you know, it's not for me to promote my ministry. It's for me to make sure my ministry is worth something so that God will want to promote it because promotion comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from the East or the West. So the, I mean, a minister's attitude should be like Jesus that I, you know, let's not, let's not go talk about me all the time here and what I'm doing. Uh, Let me just do it. And if the father wants people to find out, they will. And sure enough, they did. I mean, multitudes came to Jesus. But the point here is that he's quoting Isaiah about the Messiah's manner. Not so much. I mean, it's true. The passage does talk about him eventually going to the Gentiles. And and Jesus did, of course, and does still. The message of Christ still is going to the Gentiles. So the prophecy is true. But the part of the prophecy that Matthew's uh, featuring that the reason he's quoting the prophecy is because of the manner of Jesus' behavior, not promoting himself, and it says the Messiah will be like that. That makes that makes sense. I'm so bad about looking at the the, the, the uh, uh, preterist type stuff that I see. Oh, nations means the Gentiles, but he didn't do that yet, and and so I just missed it. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, Jesus did. <laughs> I need to, Jesus I need to came. broaden my her, my scope when I think about okay. the passages. Okay, well, remember, God told Abraham that his seed, and that means Jesus, yeah. would bring blessing to all the families of the earth. That means the Gentiles, now, uh, and Jews and Gentiles. And therefore, what Isaiah is saying is this Messiah, he is the one through whom this Abrahamic promise comes. God promised that all the nations, all the families of the world would be blessed through Abraham's seed. Here he is. He's going to the Gentiles, which is something the Jews didn't do, generally speaking. Even their Jewish mm-hmm. prophets didn't usually go to the Gentiles. So it was, uh, you know, this is what the Messiah will do to fulfill the promises that God made to Abraham. But, uh, but that's, not, that's not what Matthew's bringing out. It's true, the prophet does. But, uh, but in the course of saying this about Jesus, the prophet mentions his manner of not crying out or contending or making a big, drawing a lot of attention to himself. And so, uh, that's what Matthew is saying is going on here. Jesus is not reaching out to the Gentiles at this point in the narrative, but but he is uh, he, his manner is that which Isaiah predicted the Messiah's manner would be. Okay. Um. Um. Here, one one last question, real quick, and this would be the last one. Um. I just thought so. There could be prophecies that are given that that that, that might prophesy two or three or four things, but but the the the, the gospel writer is focusing on one part of it. Well, yeah, I mean, at the, the moment, prophecy, I never thought about that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the uh, prophecy, the prophecy you know, covers the entire church age. Christ is taking his message to the Gentiles, even through missionaries today. I mean, this is it. Yeah. Jesus ministry began uh, with the baptism of John and it continues to this day. And so the prophecy that he's bringing righteousness and justice to the Gentiles is still in process. So Matthew's not saying everything about the prophecy was fulfilled in in that week that he's describing there. He's, he's just saying the prophecy is it covers much more time than that. But it but in seeing how Jesus operated, we see that that's exactly how Isaiah said the Messiah would operate. That's what he's saying. That's good. Yeah. Okay. That, that's really good. All right. Thanks, okay, Steve. BJ. All right. Thanks for your call. Bye now. Okay. Let's talk to Hillary from Arizona. Hillary, welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick statement because um, that man who was cr- who who called about losing his faith or yes, that he uh-huh. was he was you know just getting he wasn't sure where, what what was going on. I just right. wanted to make a comment on that first, just to say that I'm going to pray for him, and then um, if he's still listening, one of the things that I thought might help him is even though he's like lost right now is just finding like some kind of church to go to and maybe like doing a life group or something where they can like talk to him more about God and just help him through some of his hard times. So I don't know. I just wanted to call and maybe give that feedback just because I think, you know, even though we're we're going through hard times, you know, and we're upset sometimes just being around people who can help us. That's good advice. We do need the support of the body of Christ. Thank you for offering that. Uh, let's talk to Travis from San Diego, California. Travis, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, I just got one question. What do yeah. they mean when they say, work out your own salvation? Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says, for it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
That means that God is doing a work in us. Our salvation is, of course, from sin. Many people don't realize that. They think salvation is from hell. Uh, The Bible says salvation is from sin. Salvation is from our aimless conduct, Peter said, of our past lives. Uh, uh, Paul said in Galatians 1 that our salvation is from this present evil age. We're being delivered from the power of this age. We're being delivered from the sin that dominated us. And we're, Jesus said, whoever practices sin is a, a slave of sin. But if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. So he's, he's setting people free uh, from sin. And therefore, when God saves us, it's not just he gives us a ticket to heaven. He does a work in us to begin to free us from our sins. And we're supposed to work that outward simply by living consistently with the work that's in. God doing a work within us and working out what he has worked into us is simply living a life that's consistent with uh, with what God's doing in us. You see, uh, Christianity, you don't overcome sin just by uh, you know, t- taking on some religious rules or some laws or something like that. You are delivered by Christ from the power of sin when you are his disciple. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Okay, and he talked about being free from sin in that context. So if you're a disciple, God's going to be delivering you. But this is an inward thing. You have to live it out. God doesn't just kind of take take your free will away and take your brain out and just make a robot and say, okay, now you're a perfect person because that's what I want you to be. If God wanted to do that, then Christians would all be perfect from day one of their Christian life. In fact, Everyone would be a Christian if, that, if God was doing that. He, we have responsibility. And our salvation is a transformation of our lives. And that transformation begins with God working a change in us, and we live according to that change in our outward behavior. That's, and that's working out the, the work of salvation that God has worked in us. So that's what I understand him to mean. I hope that's, Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that helps. Uh, Carol from New Hampshire. I don't, we don't have much time, but welcome. Hi, nice to talk to you. I'll be quick. I know it's late. Um, If if I could tell you what I believe about something, and if you could just respond to that, that's okay? Okay, but we only have a couple minutes. Go ahead. Yep, okay. So in regards to losing your faith, I mean, I believe that if you always believe in God, and the only way to really lose your faith is if you totally, deliberately turn your back on God. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can make, make mistakes. We're still human. You know, we ask for forgiveness, but that's that's what I believe. That's 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 the only way you can lose your salvation. I totally agree. I totally agree. I don't I don't think we lose our salvation when we succumb out of weakness to a temptation, for example. But we I think the only way to lose salvation is to lose Christ. Christ is our salvation. Right. And as long as we're clinging to him, we are saved. You know, we may be right. maybe it may be a bumpy ride. And we may be having some serious warfare and some even some serious failures, but if we're clinging to Christ, we're His and we're saved. The only way to stop being saved is to stop clinging to Christ and give up on Him. And uh, so I, I agree with you completely. And uh, so this brother who said he lost his faith, uh, there by this view, either he didn't have faith in the first place, or else maybe he hasn't totally lost his faith. Maybe he in fact, is just having a trial of his faith, and he he doesn't feel as he once felt, and so he feels like he doesn't believe. But if a person is still clinging to Christ, they are still a Christian, a believer, I believe. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. We are listener-supported. We pay a lot of money to radio stations so that we can bring the program to you. We don't sell anything or have any sponsors, so we just depend on God to provide, and we and he does, basically through listeners. If you'd like to be one of those listeners through whom God provides and keeps us on the air, you can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can donate from the website, though everything at the website is free. It's thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow. God bless.